Hi to everybody who is in the crowd today. Hello. Yeah. All right. Um, this is a super fun week because today we're going to talk about a really important concept um, that a good colleague of mine, Ramses, refers to as critical weaknesses. Um, this is kind of an idea that he got me wise to, and I think it's really important, and it goes under the radar a lot when talking about um, like how you can improve or really what holds people back. Um, so we're going to address it, right? Um, so what is, a, what is a critical weakness? Let's start with the beginning here. Um, a critical weakness is basically a tell, um, a consistent response to a situation. Essentially, a critical weakness is you are doing something that is not good. Um, you're doing something that the same way every single time, even if it's not good for you. And here's the most important part about it. Even if somebody punishes you for a behavior, you are incapable of changing it. And that's kind of the the core aspects of critical weakness and it kind of changes a little bit based on the level of gameplay but generally speaking that's kind of the idea um, and it's it's really important to talk about critical weaknesses because I think this is primarily how mid-level players lose um, whenever you're playing for example in pools uh, and you have to play a seated player a lot of the times that seated player they're not really even trying to play the game honestly against you. They're just looking to see what they can exploit. And as soon as they find that thing that they can exploit, they start exploiting it. And if you can't deal with that, then the set's over. Like, they're not even going to play honestly with you. They're just going to take advantage of this bad behavior you have until the set is over. So, let's be honest. Who is accurately described in this room by this statement? Does anybody do this? Oh, okay, okay. So everybody in the room swears, swears upon their dead grandma that this couldn't possibly be them, right? No one no one wants to be honest? No one wants to be honest? None of you do this? Nobody does it. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, uh, for example, Micah, you said you never do this, right? <laughs> Let's why why don't we take a look at a video? Why don't we take a look at a video? We're gonna take a look and see who's lying. You have no footage of playing. Ooh, well Alright, so um some of ooh, this one's in here. Let's take a look at this one. Let's look at Percival first. All right, so we're looking for when he gets hit, does he double jump in out of hit stun? Let's see if he does it or not. Because he, he swears up and down that he doesn't do this. He's like, this couldn't be me. I don't do this. That's not me. You're not, you're not talking about me. I, this couldn't be a critical weakness that I have, right? <laughs> yeah, if, well, I guess if he never loses neutral, we won't see it, right? Let's see what happens. Oh! Oh, hold on, hold on. If you get hit off stage, do you double jump in out of hit stun? And, you know, Grayson was like, that's not me. I win tournaments. I'm pretty good at this game. Uh oh. Uh oh. That, yeah. <laughs> Hmm, okay, okay, well that's fine, that's fine. Let's pick somebody else, let's pick somebody else. I've got more VODs. We'll find you, I know that you're in here somewhere. Oh, this is mislabeled. I think this is you. Here we go. Alright, so let's see if, Micah said that it might be him sometimes, but he's 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 prob he's pretty convinced also that this couldn't be me too much. Oh, okay, that wasn't buffered. Nice job, but he's off stage now. Oh, that wasn't buffered. Okay, so there's some there's some truth behind that statement. 
Okay. I watched three interactions, and he didn't do it any three times. I'll take that. Let's get back to what we're doing here. Um, so this is more common than you think, but this is just one of many options here. Um, and the reason why I want to point this one out is because I think this is like the most egregious offender. This is the first one that I think people should always look for. And to me is the biggest indicator that somebody is autopiloting their defense. Um, the only difference, the, or sorry, the only exception is if you play a character that actually like genuinely gets their strongest options from getting above their opponent as fast as possible. So like, for example, Snake with Cypher. Um, him jumping, d double jumping out of hit stun in and up being is a common recovery strat, and it's fine because he has good defensive mix ups and he doesn't want to recover low. Rob can go into the blast zone with his up B. It's, he doesn't often double jump out of hit stun anyway because he'll just burn her up into the blast zone, but he's another character that I wouldn't necessarily think is a problem. Um, and then I would also argue probably that Shulk is a good candidate if he's in jump art uh, just because he can get so much distance over his opponent that it's not the worst situation. He can avoid a lot of the common traps. Let's continue. Um, so we're going to talk about in concrete terms what con like critical weaknesses look like. These are some examples. Um, and like again, they don't seem like a critical weakness. But if you consistently act like this in these situations, it can be exploited against you. So buffered resource burns out of hit stun. This is jumping out of hit stun. Um, after someone blocks your aerial, has anybody ever seen somebody like near your shield and then they panic spot dodge? Anybody? Okay, that's that's this kind of situation, right? That's a thing, right? What about this one? Uh, panic spot dodge after a whiffed move. Ooh, yeah, that's a big one right there. That happens all the time. Here we go. Always doing up out of shield when someone lands on your shield. Who's played against JK Sonic? Who's played against JK Sonic in Oklahoma? How much does he like to up out of shield? A million times. Well, and when he was when he was still learning the game and he was a newer player, he would do it every time, and it really took him a long time to unlearn that habit, just because it's hard. To true, it's true. Well, and I guess Micah's probably a little bit of a victim of this as well with the link up B. It's a very tempting button. Um, buffering ledge options, this means I grab the ledge and as soon as my character can act, I do something. How many people have been back aired at the ledge by Wolf or some character because they jump off the ledge and they're like, how did he know I was going to jump there? Well, it's because you buffered your option, they just guessed. Um, fishing for grab out of shield, everybody has seen the grounded Donkey Kong looking for the grab. That's kind of what that looks like. Um, rolling in as a zoner. This one is like, you know, has anybody ever seen someone play a min-min and they're like, oh, you got too close to me, I'm rolling. Or you're playing against a character that, run, you know, that can't handle pressure like Robin. Oh, you got too close to me, I'm rolling. Um, and we could probably go find a video of a zoner doing that, but I think that you understand what I'm saying there. Um, run up shield and neutral at high percent because they're waiting for you to go first. This one is really, I think, understated, but weaker players are afraid to go first and will run up and block because they're just like, oh, well, if I just wait till you go first, then it's my turn and I win. But then they grab you and you lose neutral. Um, using double jump for no reason to recover. This one I talk with people about a lot. It's like, why are you using your jump when you don't need to? Eventually, this will get you killed for no reason. Um, aggressive ledge drop double jump aerials is another big one. And I think some there's some really bad offenders in the room on top of just in general. Because some characters it's just so tempting, you know? Like if you play Link, like forward air off of shield feels as natural as breathing. Um, for if you play Ness, forward air from shield, you know, forward air from ledge. Um, and then finally we have a preferred kill option at certain percents. And I list this one because weaker players struggle to kill at high percent and they tend to greatly prefer a specific setup uh, so like in this case I'd be thinking about nest players fishing for back throw uh, or fox players fishing for up smash you know etc or maybe snake players looking for an up tilt and a good player is capable of using those options without being desperate uh, the desperation is kind of what we want to avoid so pain response um, how do you know that somebody has a critical weakness uh, so I'm going to explain to you this method that I have, and it is very effective because it kind of highlights the core, you know, reason why critical weaknesses are bad. Um, 
So the first step that we have to do is we have to identify one of these behaviors, right? This person interacts consistently whenever this thing happens. Um, you have to see that it happens, and then you have to exploit it. In other words, you have to make the desired behavior feel bad. Um, so if, you know, you see a joker player that likes to do back air out of shield a lot, you've got to make him do back air out of shield and then make it feel bad. And then the third step is observe, right? Do they stop back airing out of shield even after you introduce pain? Um, and then so you repeat the situation. It's almost like a little experiment in conditioning, right? Um, and so you do it again. You, you bait out the back air. If the back air comes out, and then you punish it again, and then you observe one more time, are they responding to pain? Are they responding to the punish or that their button is not successful? And this is where most, like, players lose in pools um, because you are getting punished for something that you don't even realize it's a problem and you're incapable of adapting because you don't even understand that your opponent has learned something about you and they're taking advantage of it and so I think this is a really important idea to be cognizant of because if you're playing against somebody and you're like man that snake dash attacked me like six times in a row it's not because snake dash attack is broken it's because they're taking advantage of a critical weakness of yours and I think that distinction is very important um, because, like, why would somebody do something complicated and hard when they could just dash attack you six times? It doesn't make any sense. Uh, getting your money's worth. So everything that we've been talking about so far is mostly related to mid-level players or maybe newer players uh, or even just, you know, a solid player who just hasn't spent a lot of time thinking about this particular idea. Um, once you start playing better players critical weaknesses still exist but they are good enough that they can adapt once pain is introduced and so we have to adjust the process um, now you have to observe that there is a critical weakness and allow them to get away with it and then choose what time you're going to punish it because as soon as you punish it they're gonna go okay they know how to deal with this button right so like if you've played against someone before and for example Micah um, if someone is really good at baiting out up B at a shield and you like do bad ones a couple of times, you do less of them, right? So like when you get punished for it, it makes you adapt away from the option. And that's kind of what this is talking about. Like someone might only have one or two opportunities to get a punish. Um, and so if they're going to get a punish, it better be like 60 damage or a stock and not 10 damage. Because otherwise they've cashed in on the behavior they learned about from you and then they get nothing else out of it because you just are more careful in the future. And I think this is a really important idea as you get higher up um, in the competitive sphere and you play tougher opponents. You've got to pick and choose when you actually cash out your information on your opponent. Um, and that kind of is very closely related to all this. Okay. Uh, the last thing that I want to talk about before we watch the video um, is basically, like, how do I apply this to myself, right? Because Unless you are winning tournaments, you are probably not the person exploiting critical weaknesses, and you are probably the person being exploited. Um, and so, like, we gotta, you know, how do you address that, right? How do I, how do I do less things that are bad? Uh, well, there's a, there's a process for that, right? Um, one, you have to recognize that you have a critical weakness. It's hard to do this in the moment, but it's really easy when you watch your own gameplay. Anybody ever like watched themselves play, and they're like. Oh, God, this is so cringe, you know? I played so bad. And you know why? It's because you sit there and you get to watch. And, like, so many players will watch themselves play, and then they will refuse to admit that they have a critical weakness or they have a problem with how they play. And they're just like, oh, well, this is just how I like to play. Like, I just like to be aggressive, or I'm just a defensive player, or I like to recover high. Like, no. You have a... a, a player tendency that is getting exploited and you need to deal with it or else you're going to continue losing to people that you should be beating because uh, they're taking advantage of it. So you have to recognize the problem. That's step one. Uh, step two, and this is really important here, you have to break the muscle memory for this stuff because a critical weakness is at its core um, autopiloting. You are autopiloting that interaction. You see something, and without even thinking about it, a reflex occurs, and you do your input. And the only, the only way you can really undo this muscle memory is with by, by training your hands away from it. 
You have to put yourself in the exact situation. You have to make it realistic. And then you have to just not do the bad thing. And then it sounds so silly, right? It sounds so simple. Like, to solve the problem, all you have to do is someone hits you off stage, and then you just don't jump. And then you do it again. Someone hits you off stage, and you just don't jump. And it's like, well, that's super easy. Why do I need to go into the training mode to practice that? Like, I can just think about that. It's super important that you actually make your hands do the work because otherwise you're not going to unlearn the muscle memory. Because when you're under pressure in a match, you're not going to have time to be thinking about this. And you are not going to rise to the occasion as a player. You're going to sink to the level of your training. And so if you don't actually train your hands to resist the temptation to double jump in out of hits done, you're not going to stop doing it. And that's why it's a critical weakness is because even if it hurts to do, even if you're getting punished, you're physically incapable of doing it because your muscle memory has trained you to do that input under pressure. And that's kind of the theme of what we're talking about. Okay. So I've run out of content. Uh, we're going to look at this VOD. This VOD got posted a couple of hours ago. Uh, Port 6 was this weekend, as many of you know. Um, Spargo is a very good player, and Isco is a snake player. I don't know who he is. Um, I've never watched this VOD before. And we're just going to kind of watch, right? And probably we're going to see a lot more consistent behaviors that fall under what we're talking about from the snake player. But we're just going to kind of try to apply you know, what we've been talking about to this video. We're just going to kind of watch it and see what we notice. All right, so um, we're going to back up a little bit. I know this is kind of slow, right? Like I'm not talking, we're just kind of watching the VOD. I want to rewind a little bit, and we're going to point out some things that Spargo has not yet actually taken advantage of, but things that I have just noticed. Um, and I think the big one is that this snake player does not like to air dodge out of disadvantage. They like to press buttons. Uh, they like to try to fight their way out. And I feel like Spargo at some point will probably try to take advantage of that. So right here, for example, he nares his way out of disadvantage. It's a very committal option. Uh, he doesn't he doesn't air dodge at all. Right here, he doesn't air dodge. He lands with a grenade. What about this situation? Still no air dodge. So he's very reluctant to actually air dodge, uh, and he would rather try to press buttons. Because normally you want to kind of avoid swinging at Snake when he air dodges because he'll land before you and then you'll get reversal. So Spargo is being very careful to respect the air dodge. But he's not air dodging. And the stock goes away here at one moment. I think he hits a back air. Yeah, he's a d back air. Okay, so second stock. He doesn't land with... So, look at the second... Uh-oh. Look at the second stock here. Um, a little back. There we go. Nope, right here. So right here, now Sparker's being more aggressive with covering the space. He's like, you're not going to air dodge. You're not going to air dodge. Look at it, he's starting to swing a lot more aggressively now in the space. Because he's like, dude, you're not air dodging out of my traps, so I'm just going to go up there and hit you. He still doesn't air dodge. Yeah. 
Ooh, okay, so this is a good one. There's been a couple of times where the snake has rolled after Spargo has gotten close. So look at this interaction right here. He gets close, and Spargo doesn't swing with Pyra where the snake is. Instead, he turns around, he's waiting with this down tilt. Because he was expecting that interaction to happen. He's not dead. Still no air dodge. And again, Spargo is more confident at lashing out at him. Because he... Look at this. That down air? If he had... not Dang it. i got to get used to my controls. With this down air right here, if he had respected the nair dodge, he might have gotten punished for it. This one right here. So Spargo has already become a lot more aggressive at contesting his landings. And so like even right here, that down air is specifically because he's looking at covering Snake and forcing him to air dodge. He's like, dude, you can't, you can't land through me. You've got to go. Oh, that was cool. And again, there's no air dodge. Spargo's becoming very comfortable as this game proceeds with just going up and hitting him. He's like, you're not going to air dodge. You're not afraid of me. I'm going to go up there and hit you. That was a smart interaction. That was also a smart interaction. Using neutral B to deal with the grenade. I think he's dead. Yeah. Okay, another look at landing on him, because he's just not, he's refusing to air dodge. Oh, that was smart, to combo into that. Okay. Almost done, right? Let's look at game two and see if the information from game one is evolving into more confident option coverage game two. Nice damage. Ooh. Ouch. Ouch. Yikes. And, like, again, these are... This section right here, he's like, dude, you're not going to air dodge. I'm just going to forward smash. You're going to land on me. Spargo is becoming a lot more aggressive with his commitments against Snake's landing because this this Snake player, I have not seen him actually air dodge to land once. And, yeah, it can be punished, but because he's not doing it repeatedly and he's not mixing up his behavior, it's becoming a bit of a crit critical weakness, and Spargo is able to exploit it. Again, another aggressive coverage. And like Spargo, he stopped mixing up his options. He's always contesting his landing now, every single time. And it's because he's not expecting the snake to actually be defensive anymore. And again, he backers at a disadvantage, and he just covers the hitbox. Um, and I think it's really important to like focus on that, because as you can see, like that one tendency just is how that snake player plays. And the longer the set went on, because that behavior didn't change, Spargo became more aggressive in his advantage state, and he became more committal, and he was rewarded in bigger chunks for it because there's not he's not guessing anymore. It's not a risk. He knows his opponent's going to do it. It's because they have a critical weakness. They refuse to mix up their defensive landing with an air dodge to avoid these hitboxes. And so why shouldn't he commit? Okay. Uh, that's the end of my content for today. Thanks, everybody, for kind of tuning in. Uh, it's a bit of a shorter session, but I think it's really important to kind of discuss this stuff. Um, this one in particular is just, I don't know, it's endemic among players. Uh, and everybody is guilty of it. It's not something that you can just be like, you can't think your way out of it. You have to be very deliberately aware that it's a problem for you, and you need to be, 
you know, just you have to take steps to correct it with your muscle memory. Um, he did roll behind. Okay, um, that's that's all. Thanks very much. You guys have a nice day.